We're going to talk about how evil Democrats are and what they're doing now. We're going to talk to a movie star, an attorney general, a lawyer. We are all over the place tonight on I'm Right. Why the border? Why illegal immigration? Why, look, look, let's just talk about some moves Joe Biden's pulling recently. Joe Biden is shielding illegals now from being deported. You know, he gave that speech where he pretended like he was being tough on the border now. There's been no more border enforcement. In fact, since that speech, he's bent over backwards to protect not only just regular illegals, which are already criminals, I need to point out, but convicted criminals, shielding them from deportation. They're taking crazy steps now, saying, hey, if you're an illegal and you skip across the border and marry a U.S. citizen, boom, you're good to go. You can't be deported. They are bending over backwards to ensure everyone they've brought here can stay here, and they're bending over backwards. They are going all in now to bring in as many as humanly possible. Now, why? Well, I'll tell you something. There's something that hits me a lot. You've probably picked up on this if you watch the show, which obviously you watch the show you're watching now. But there's something that hits me a lot. How truly, truly evil and depraved the people are who leave this country. They are evil. And you want to hear how evil these people are? They have power, okay? They have power. The presidency, it's a very, very powerful thing. They have power, and they want to hang on to that power. And they want to destroy the country in the process because they will burn an evil man. What's that old quote? An evil man will burn down his own country to rule over the ashes. That's Democrats in this country and Republican leadership, too. I need to point that out. Republicans love amnesty, too. But right now, Joe Biden's looking at, I don't want to say a, a loss in an election because it's way too early to say that. But the poll numbers are bad. It looks bad. It looks like. There's a chance Joe Biden's going to be a four-year president. The American people are sick over it. And part of the reason the American people are sick over Joe Biden's presidency is illegal immigration. So wrap your mind around that. The people are mad about illegal immigration, and that's going to result in Joe Biden being removed from office, losing his reelection. In response to that, the evil people who run this country are bringing in as many as they possibly can before they might lose the election. And the ones that are here, they're essentially building a wall around them to make sure they can't be deported. How evil is that? How evil is that? It is, and this is something that I've accepted and something I understand, something you and I have talked about before, but how do we deal with living in a country, sharing a country, remember we all live here, sharing a country with people who want to destroy it and are willing to do anything to keep power and destroy it. How do we handle that? I, look, it's not just like this is a right-wing talking point. Around the planet, people know, these illegals know, hey, with Joe Biden there, we can do whatever we want to America. We've been talking to migrants from all over the world arriving here into the San Diego sector. I talked to one man from Turkey. Here's what he had to say. What do you think of President Biden? Uh, Biden, I love Biden. <laughs> Why do you love Biden? Uh, because uh, Biden, we love. Why do you love him? Uh, Biden uh, help us. That man was from Turkey. We've had hordes of military-aged Chinese males. We've had how many people on the terrorist watch list that we know of being intentionally released into the country. By the grace of God, they've managed to track down a couple of them after the fact. But the people who run this country are so evil, they're hoovering up as much of the third world as humanly possible before they might lose the presidency. And people get confused as to why. Listen, Cloward Piven, I would highly recommend you go look up Cloward Piven. This is a, a phrase you've probably heard of before. 
they were a couple of communist professors and they were trying to figure out how do we destroy America? That's really, it's honestly, that they wrote it down. How do we destroy this evil country that is America? And illegal immigration was a central part of their plan. The plan essentially is, no matter how big and powerful a country is, you can overwhelm its systems and bring about its collapse. You understand that your rent mortgage is sky high because of illegal immigration? Your health care costs are sky high in part because of illegal immigration. The education system in this country is rotting out from underneath us. We have high school graduates who can't read or write now because in part of illegal immigration. Illegals are destroying wages, destroying the job market. You can't import millions of people from nations who have no loyalty to yours and continue to have a country. And that's why Democrats do it. How evil is that? And th there's nothing they won't do. The strategic oil reserve, you remember that? That's there for emergency purposes, as in WW3 cooks off. The Biden administration is once again draining the strategic oil reserve in an election year in order to keep gas prices low. Gas prices low. The people who lead the country are so inhumanly evil, they will put this country on dangerous ground without oil in order to keep power for themselves. You do understand that that big, beautiful Navy we have, the Air Force we have, most of that goes right on the scrap heap without oil. You know what uh, a plane without oil is worth? Nothing. In fact, a plane, a fighter jet without oil, it's worth less than your car. It'd be more militarily beneficial to strap a couple machine guns on your car and drive it at the enemy than have a plane that can't fly. We can have a military that is worth virtually nothing if we run out of oil. They know this and they're draining it anyway. And you know what I do find funny? Not funny, horrific, but this whole Ukraine thing. We know now, we know, uh, several reports have been out that now a couple times over the last year, Vladimir Putin has come out and tried to negotiate an end to this. And this is not a celebration of Putin. He invaded, but Putin has come to the table and said, hey, we can end this thing. Very clearly, Russia has seized some of Ukraine. They're not going to be able to get them out. And Putin has said, okay, we got it. Let's come to an agreement. Let's end this thing. And yet, it's funny, the powers that be who run this country are adamant that Ukraine must go on without end. But at the same time, when it comes to things like uh, Israel and their war with Hamas, those same people become peace hawks. It's inconceivable that in the past few months, the administration has been withholding weapons and ammunition to Israel. Israel, America's closest ally, fighting for its life, fighting against Iran and our other common enemies. Secretary Blinken assured me that the administration is working day and night to remove these bottlenecks. I certainly hope that's the case. Well, why are they treating it differently? Why are they treating one one way and the other one the other way? Well, it's very clear that they have a vested monetary interest in keeping Ukraine going forever. And it's very clear they have a political interest in this whole Israel-Hamas thing going away. It's dividing the Democrat Party. It's making Joe Biden look bad. They're worried about all these protests and counter-protests that are probably going to be coming at the convention this year. So it's all, all of it, is simply for selfish reasons. None of the people doing anything making decisions for this country are doing so on behalf of the country. They do everything they do only on behalf of themselves. And the lengths they go to to lie to your face so they can keep power. Joe Biden can't function anymore. Everyone can see it. It's not just how he talks. It's how he walks. It's how he looks with that glassed out look in his eye, half dead all the time. Everyone knows that there's about two marbles still rattling around in Joe Biden's head. 
And these people have the gall to stand in front of you and tell you that these videos that we've all seen are cheap fakes. Uh, secondly, there, there seems to be a, a sort of rash of videos that have been edited to make the president appear officially frail or mentally confused. Um, I, I'm wondering if the, the White House is especially worried about the fact that this, this appears to be a, a, a pattern that we're seeing more of. Well. Yeah, we, and I think you all have called this the cheap fakes video, and that's exactly what they are. They are cheap fakes video. Uh, they are done in bad faith, uh, and uh, and some of your news organization uh, have uh, have been very clear, have stressed that these right wing, uh, the right wing critics of the president have a credibility problem uh, because of the fact checkers have repeatedly caught them pushing misinformation, disinformation. Evil, evil people run the country, and evil people in the media trying to work on behalf of the regime. How evil is that? Did you see Nicole Wallace, this freaking woman? There's a growing and insidious trend in right-wing media, broadcast, print, and social media. It is to take highly misleading and selectively edited videos of President Biden directly from Republican National Committee social media accounts and then use those videos to spread messages virally to cast doubt on President Biden's fitness for office. These people really are evil. They're not wrong. They're not misguided. We are led by people enriching themselves and destroying our country on purpose. And sometimes it's a lot to take in, isn't it? All that may have made you uncomfortable, but I am right. We have the Attorney General of Kansas, he's going to join us next. There is something out there, I'm not trying to get my hopes up, but there are some Republican AGs who are starting to step up across the country. They're starting to develop teeth when it comes to dealing with these evil organizations, that when it comes to dealing with the evil left, and that is a very good thing. We are going to need teeth, and I love that some of these people have it. Before we get to him, though, let's get to your coffee. Where do you get your coffee from? Who brings you your coffee? You see, as far as industries go, coffee might be the worst of them when it comes to all this left-wing crap. I don't know what it is. It's maybe there's something in the water, but these coffee companies, they're all lefty commie filth, except for Blackout Coffee. Blackout Coffee doesn't do that. They are exactly the opposite. They have a million different flavors. If you're a flavored coffee person, they deliver it to your front door and they share and promote our values. Put your money where your morals are. We have to be purposeful about putting our money where our morals are. They'll deliver it to your front door. Go to blackoutcoffee.com slash jesse. That gets you 20% off your first order, so make your first order a fatty. Blackoutcoffee.com slash jesse. We'll be back. Republican attorney generals, attorneys general. I hate that that's how you say that. Either way, they're starting to really, really step up in major ways now that we have some decent ones in this country. Pfizer, remember all those Pfizer ads you used to see all over television? There was a lot of crap in those ads. A lot of, well, lies, for lack of a better way to put it. And Kansas's AG is all over these guys like White on Rice. Joining me now, Chris Kobach, the attorney general of the great state of Kansas. Okay, Mr. Attorney General, what are you doing to Pfizer for all the dirty lies they told? <laughs> well, we uh, have brought a uh, civil lawsuit under our Kansas Consumer Protection Act uh, seeking uh, monetary penalties and damages and injunctive relief uh, for misleading, making deceptive and misleading statements in advertising and promoting uh, their COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, we filed that case on, on Monday and uh, the ball is rolling now. We've, we've, it's a 69-page complaint, and we allege in great detail uh, various instances in which Pfizer made statements that were uh, contrary to information they had at the time. Um, you know, just to give you two examples, uh, one is with respect to pregnancy. Uh, Pfizer uh, advertised its vaccine or promoted its vaccine as being safe for people who are pregnant. 
but as early as October of 2020, they were in possession of information from an, from their own study done on rats, uh, pregnant rats, of course, that showed um, stillbirths and other complications, litter deaths uh, resulting from the vaccine. And then a few months later, in February 2021, uh, they had information uh, of a study with over 400 pregnant women. And in that study, uh, the majority of women had some medical complication uh, relating to their pregnancy uh, right after they took the COVID vaccine. So that's one example. And then the other one is the myocarditis, which of course is a heart condition. Um, the CEO of Pfizer was asked if there's any uh, connection between the Pfizer vaccine and myocarditis. He said, no, there are no safety signals or no signals, the term of art they use. Um, but in fact, uh, Pfizer was aware of multiple studies that had indicated and multiple data sets that had indicated there was a connection uh, between the vaccine and myocarditis. So uh, those are just a couple of examples. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear that they uh, said things publicly that were not consistent with what they knew privately. Yeah, and I'm glad you're focusing on that part of it as well, not that uh, you need any help doing your job. The fact that they knew, because there's a lot of revisionist history today. We didn't know, nobody knew, we didn't know. Pfizer had this information and lied, didn't they? Well, they had this information and they said things that were misleading and were, did not, you know, were clearly contradictory to the information they had. And <clears throat> let's put this back, let's, let's go back in time and remember so some people were uh, taking the vaccine, forced to take a vaccine because they were under duress. Uh, their employer was forcing them to choose between their job and, and taking the vaccine, and maybe they were given a deadline to take your vaccine by such and such a date. Uh, other individuals uh, elected to take the vaccine voluntarily, uh, but they also felt some anxiety, and they felt that maybe their, their health was at risk uh, if they didn't do it. And so people were making a decision quickly uh, and they were making a decision, in some instances, under duress. And when they make that decision, they had to choose which vaccine to take. And in making that choice, it is essential that American consumers are presented with the truth and with all medical evidence that is out there so that they can make that choice on an informed basis. And that's really what we're, we're getting at here with our Consumer Protection Act uh, charges against Pfizer. They acted in a way that was deceptive when Americans and Kansans in particular were making that choice about whether to take the vaccine and if so, which vaccine to take. You know, everybody knows that whenever a pharmaceutical product is advertised on radio or TV, there is a long list of disclaimers. And that's part of how our system works. So you inform the consumer what the risks might be. Uh, in this case, as we allege, Pfizer not only didn't inform of the risks, they stated that the risks were not there when, in fact, they knew that the risks were. Gosh, that's friggin' evil. Your suit goes into the censorship of dissenting opinions, too, doesn't it? Yeah, Pfizer also took, we, we allege in the suit that Pfizer took steps uh, to uh, stop or suppress um, you know, opinions contrary to what they were saying publicly uh, on, uh, on social media platforms. Let's talk about some other things you're doing, which I love, standing up, standing in between a federal government that has lost its mind and the people of your great state. Tell me about the ATF and you. Yeah, so Kansas has uh, launched a lawsuit against the ATF. Uh, many people may not be aware, but the ATF recently passed a regulation or promulgated a regulation that basically says that when one individual sells a, a firearm to another individual just out of their personal collections, not dealers, dealing with dealers, uh, if you make any profit, even $1, uh, you will be deemed to be a dealer in fire, engaged in the business of dealing firearms, and you therefore have to get an FFL, federal firearms license, and you have to run a background check. Uh, well, that's not the way the law has been, and Americans for decades, for more than decades, centuries, have been uh, selling firearms to one another, uh, trading firearms, and that can also be considered a sale of firearms traded for another, and one is slightly more valuable than the other, then the, the potentially one person has made a profit. So again, it's uh, this is good. if this rule stays in place, it, it's going to effectively make it very difficult, if not in some cases impossible, 
or friends, and in some cases, family, uh, to, to purchase firearms from one another. And, and the reason they're doing this is pretty transparent. They're trying to do what they could not accomplish in Congress, which is close the gun show loophole, which they you know, refer to it derogatorily as. Um, and so they're going to try to do it through a regulation, and we are suing, and we, uh, we expect that we will prevail. Good. Good. Okay, finally, to wrap this whole thing up, Biden's student loan handout. It's amazing. We live in a country where the president now just gives speeches talking about how the Supreme Court tried to stop me, but I didn't let them. I don't, I don't think that's yeah. how it works. Anyway, what are you doing with all this? Yeah, so we uh, have, have launched a lawsuit, uh, which is we're awaiting a decision on a preliminary injunction right now. Uh, we have filed with a group of other states a suit saying that, look, Biden lost in the Supreme Court uh, in 2023 with his first round of student loan handouts or cancellations. And uh, now he's brought another one. He's basically, it's basically the same thing over again, just with a, using a slightly different provision of statutes. The Biden administration is essentially saying, well, okay, we lost when we, sit, we cited this statutory provision. How about if we cite this other one over here and attempt to cancel student loans in an extraordinary way, billions of dollars. And, uh, you know, we intend to prevail in court again. Only Congress has the authority to forgive or cancel student loans. And let's not forget that when a loan is canceled or forgiven, it's not like it just comes out of thin air and it just goes away. No, the, the debt is transferred from the student borrower to the taxpayer. And so there's a, there's a in addition to the legal reasons why this is a big deal and it's against the law, there's just a policy reason why in the world would we do that? Why would we transfer debt from people who have you know, gotten expensive graduate degrees or whatever and taken out big loans to people who didn't go to college or to people who paid their own way through college or who people who worked their way through college? It makes no sense and it's unfair and we hope to prevail in court on that issue as well. Yeah, I hope you do too. Mr. Attorney General, thank you so much. Please keep at him. I, I love seeing that. That's awesome. We have some good AGs now. I dig it. And we haven't had many in the past. We have some good ones now. You know what else is good? Lone Star Transfer is good. Did you know that? Lone Star Transfer. They're the company that saves you from that timeshare you can't seem to get off your back. That timeshare you want out of, but you can't. You sign the contract. They told you you're trapped for life. You're paying the annual fees. You're trying to cut costs and you want out. Well, Stop calling the timeshare company and start calling Lone Star Transfer. They will set you free. Lone Star Transfer. This is the family business. They have an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau for a reason. They are 99% successful. I'm not making that up. 99% successful getting people out of their timeshare. Free. You ready to be free? Call 844-310-264. Four, six. We'll be back. There's all these smart legal things that happen, and I don't have any idea what's going on because I'm stupid and uneducated. I've been told that the Supreme Court has some big, fatty opinions coming down. What exactly is coming this Thursday or Friday? I don't freaking know, but I bet Katie does. Joining me now, Katie Cherkasky. She is a former federal prosecutor, and she wrote a book on woke warriors, how these dirty commies are taking over everything. I highly, highly recommend it. Okay, Katie, what does this mean? We have opinions coming down. What's happening? It's a big day. It's going to be a big day at the Supreme Court because this is the last day before the election that the court is scheduled to release opinions. And there's two big cases relating to President Trump that everybody's waiting on. And one of those is the immunity case. And that is the big question about whether a president has immunity and to what extent they have immunity for acts that they commit while they're in office. And it's actually a very complicated legal question. Um, but that that opinion will impact the rest of President Trump's pending criminal cases. But not only that, I think it could also impact even the New York conviction that came down. So there's, and of, of course, of course, beyond President Trump, it will impact the entire country forever. So it's a significant moment that we're all anticipating um, with that opinion. And then there's another opinion related to one of the criminal statutes that was used against many of the January 6th individuals. And that 
people were convicted under that the Supreme Court is looking at to determine whether it is actually a proper charge that should have been brought against those people um, or whether their conduct didn't even fall within that charge. And so that's also important because that same charge is something that President Trump is charged with in the January 6th case. So it is an absolutely a big day, um, especially for President Trump, but really for the country, generally speaking. Yeah, no doubt about it. Okay, I'm not asking, I'm not going to hold you to this. I'm not asking you to be an oracle here, but do we have some idea of which way they might go? Just from the layperson's view, I have a hard time believing the Supreme Court is going to give some blanket immunity ruling, but at the same time, a lot of these prosecutions are ridiculous. What say you? Well, actually, I've been writing about this for a long time. And last summer, I wrote an article for The Hill saying that the president should have full immunity unless they were actually impeached and convicted by the Senate. And there's a whole long explanation legally as to why I think that's the correct outcome here. But I agree with you that, that the court probably won't go so far as to say that anything a president does while in office is immune from criminal prosecution. But based upon the justices' questions during the oral arguments, it seemed pretty clear that they were open to some degree of immunity. And the question is exactly how they define that. Um, and I think what they're going to find as they were going through this process of making a decision is that when you start talking about the president, which is obviously one person that is an entire branch of government unto themselves, how do you start to parse apart when they are on the job or off the job? And how do you hold them accountable for things when supposedly they can't be prosecuted while they're in office, so you wait around? Um, they are the head of the DOJ. They are the head of law enforcement in this country. And you start getting into a lot of hypotheticals about what if the president did this and some people disagree with that or it turned out to be a negligent decision. Could that lead to a prosecution? And essentially what happens is that you'll see that really anything could potentially be twisted into a criminal allegation, especially by an opposing political party when somebody leaves office. So I know that wasn't a direct prediction, but I think that the court will have to go pretty far to say that a president is probably immune in many circumstances from prosecution um, for acts that they undertake while in office. And whether there are some exceptions to that, I think that's the big question here. Let's talk uh, more specifically about the New York trial really quickly before we switch gears to the president's dirtball son. Assuming the Supreme Court does not give Donald Trump blanket immunity for these ridiculous charges in New York, we're not expecting Donald Trump to go to state prison in New York, right? Well, of course, as everyone's been discussing, now that President Trump's been convicted, he does theoretically face jail time. And the decision about that is left solely up to the trial judge, Judge Murchon, who, of course, has been very unfair and many people have noted has been, been very unconstitutional in a lot of his rulings. So the idea of whether he could sentence Trump to jail is a real possibility. But whether he actually serves that time is another question, because even if he gets sentenced to jail, which is possible, although it shouldn't happen. Um, the appeal of that case, just the normal appeal, would normally essentially pause the execution of the sentence while the appeals are pending. So what that means is that the appeals take a long time. Sometimes it takes even years to complete appeals on these types of criminal cases, and that the appellate court can, can essentially pause the uh, jail sentence while the appeals are still being decided, even aside from the immunity issue. But I think personally that if the court says that there is some sort of immunity for acts committed while in office, that that would impact the New York case because at the end of the day, even though the New York case talked a lot about these you know, affairs with Stormy Daniels back in the day and all these things that happened many, many years ago, the charged offenses, the actual payments and the bookkeeping that were at the heart of the charged offenses, all of that occurred after President Trump was in office. And so at the very least, I think that that could uh, result in the, the case being sent back down for a, a factual analysis about whether or not it falls on one side of the immunity line. So I think the immunity case could absolutely pause the sentencing there as well. But even without that, even if the court says that somehow that New York case is not applicable, the regular appellate process will pause any sort of jail sentence for the foreseeable future, more than likely. Katie, talk to me about what you found inside of the United States military. This is something that's near and dear to my heart, to everyone who watches this show. We talk a lot 
about the rot that's taking place within it. Most people from the outside can't see it. You wrote a book on it. What did you find? Yeah, I did. So I was in the Air Force JAG many moons ago, but even uh, since I left the service back in 2013 or so, I've been working with military members daily. I run a military law practice where I represent military members who are facing criminal or derogatory actions. And so because I'm so deeply embedded in the legal system, in the military's legal system, I have seen directly how these liberal and woke policies have been infiltrated on the Department of Defense. Um, and we could go down the line and talk about um, everything from the DEI policies, the way that they handle allegations of sexual assault, the way that they handle um, even just the COVID pandemic situation that came down, the clamp down on free speech, all of the LGBTQ uh, situation that they've kind of ushered into the Department of Defense. All of these things, I mean, the book is obviously um, <laughs> inclusive of all these topics, but when you're, when you're not really intimately familiar with the military, you might not understand how political it really is. And because of the leadership um, at the White House and at the Pentagon, which are you know all political appointees, the uh, Department of Defense is just completely woke. It's completely, in my opinion, probably wasting so much of its time on all of these policies and investigations that they there's no way to tell that they're um, actually operationally ready for any sort of conflict. Um, it's just practical when you're spending that much time on these matters. There's no way that you're putting the time into training that should be required. Golly. The book, Woke Warriors, go pick it up. Katie Cherkasky, thank you so much for coming on, talking to us for a little bit today. All right. There is something we have not forgotten about and we will not forget about. January 6th, the event the communists have used to lock up over a thousand of their political opponents. My friend Nick Searcy did a movie on the whole thing. He's got a whole lot to say. There are innocent people already rotting in prison because of these dirty communists. We're going to talk to Nick in just a moment. Before we talk to Nick, let me talk to you about your cell phone. We all have them. And here's the thing about your cell phone. You pay the bill automatically, don't you? Everyone does. You put in your credit card online and they just there's a payment every single month. Do you make an automatic payment to commies every month? You know that Verizon is a terrible company, right? AT&T, T-Mobile. These are soulless, evil, leftist monster companies. Are you paying them? I'm not paying them. I have paid them. I've had all three of those before. T-Mobile was the one we switched from. We switched to Pure Talk. I pay half of what I used to pay. Pure Talk CEO is a veteran, fought for this country, loves this country, shares our values. So you can keep your phone, keep your number, save money, and pay a company that actually agrees with you. PureTalk.com slash TV is where you go do it. So go do it. We'll be back. It's not protest. It's insurrection. When I said how many agents or assets of the government were present on January 5th and January 6th and agitating in the crowd to go into the Capitol and how many went into the Capitol, can you answer that now? I don't know the answer to that question. You don't know how many there were or there were none? I don't know the answer to either of those questions. I think you may have just perjured yourself that you don't know that there were any. Pops and when F starts to leave, he's got four people in front of him and four people behind him, and they literally get him the hell out of there. Based on your investigation so far, do you have any evidence that the Capitol attack was organized by quote fake Trump protesters? We have not seen evidence of that. We need to go into the Capitol. I was in the front. I also orchestrated it. Pretty interesting, pretty ominous. I actually, I gotta stop watching Nick's movies. Every time I do, I just realize what kind of a banana republic we live in. Joining me now, my friend, Amer actor, producer, author. I hate these guys who do everything good. Nick Searcy, he, he's the author of the new book, by the way, Justify This, which we will get to in a little while. Nick, do you think you're better than me because you have all these talents? No, I'm kind of the same. I mean, we're both literally authors now. I've literally written a book. Oh, oh! <laughs> why did you? Why do you have to torment me, Nick? I'm not even. I'm not going to let you bait me. I'm not going to let you. <laughs> All right. Honestly, let's talk about the war. 
What's that? We're literary giants, both of us. You know. uh, well, obviously, yes. World famous authors, of course. Okay, War on Truth. Uh, you keep making these documentaries exposing these people, and every single time I watch one, I'm just floored. Nick, do you think the feds did January 6th? Did they plan and coordinate it? There's no question. Yeah, not in my mind. I mean, after after all the people we talked to, all the people that have given eyewitness testimony of what they saw that day, there is no question. And and to me, the biggest factor in proving that is that what was going on inside the House and Senate that day was exactly what the people who went to Washington, like me, wanted to have happen. The only people that wanted that procedure stopped were the Democrats who wanted to stop them from sending the election back to the states to be certified. So they had to stage this insurrection nonsense in order to stop the House and Senate from doing its constitutional duty. Yeah, a lot of people forget that. And people don't seem to understand how many lives have already been ruined, destroyed over this whole thing. I mean, I realize the big man gets all the publicity convicted in New York and whatnot, but all those normal people matter too, and they've been rotting in jail because of all this, haven't they? Yes, and that's that's really the biggest part of the war on truth. The trailer doesn't really show you what I think is the most important part of the film, which is telling these people's stories. These people have had their lives completely ruined by the lies of, of people like Liz Cheney and the January 6th committee because they have to advance this narrative. They have to keep this going, that this was the most dangerous insurrection that ever happened in the country after the Civil War. And, and these people are, are, are just normal, decent people that you would trust with your pets or your children while you were out of town. And they're being treated like they're you know, domestic terrorists and, and really just having their lives destroyed. And so that's, that's the bulk of the film, is trying to show you who these people are that they are talk that they are calling domestic terrorists. Yeah, they they've gone a long ways to try to paint the right as domestic terrorists, and of course they've justified every time someone on the right gets uh, <clears throat> hurt. What did you find out about Ashley Babbitt? Well, in the in the film, we talked to Taylor Hanson, who was an eyewitness to what happened to Ashley Babbitt. And what you see in our movie that you really haven't seen anywhere else, very especially not on the mainstream media, is that Ashley Babbitt was in that hallway trying to stop the people who were breaking the windows, who were trying to break the door down. And the people that she stopped were actually Antifa people like Zachary Alum. And so when she, she was pulling people back saying, stop, she was talking to the police officers in there saying, you need more backup. And then she was shocked. She, she jumped in the window and was killed without a word of warning, nothing. And Taylor Hansen was right there and tells the story. And the other part of that is that Taylor Hansen repeatedly told the January 6th committee that he was an eyewitness, that he had video, that he was there, and they never, they never questioned him. There's not one word about Ashley Babbitt in the January 6th committee's report. Not one word about Roseanne yeah. Boylan in the January 6th committee's report. They're covering it up. Yeah, how funny that is. That Nancy Pelosi video was making the rounds last week. Before anyone forgets about it, here it was. We have responsibility, Terry. We did not have any accountability for what was going on there, and we should have. This is ridiculous. You're going to ask me in the middle of the thing when they've already breached the the uh, inaugural stuff that, that uh, uh, should we call the Capitol Police? I mean, the uh, National Guard? Why weren't the National Guard there to begin with? They thought that they had sufficient resources. No, there's not a question of how they had been. They don't know. They clearly didn't know, and I take responsibility for not having them just prepare for more. Nick, what do you make of all that? She's such a terrible actress. To me, that whole thing was staged to make it look like she just found out that the National Guard was not called. She knew that they weren't called because she stopped them from being called. That whole thing is just, a, that's her trying to get away with her culpability in the whole day. And she's, she's a really bad actress, but of course she's convincing to Democrats because they, they're used to really bad acting.
Yeah. <laughs> Nick, do you think I could have been a movie star? I have always felt that I would be a huge movie star. You'd be a really tall one. Yes, you would be really huge. Um, <laughs> I, I think. <laughs> I, I think. Look, you can look at it this way. If I could do it, you could probably do it. You know, you just. Have to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, Nick, Trump's going to debate Biden next week. He's going to be asked about January 6th. He's going to be asked about the January 6th political prisoners. What should he say? What should he do? He should say straight out that he's going to pardon them. And he should say straight out that these people were set up and that uh, they, they should not continue to get away with the lie that they have perpetrated about January 6th, because that's what it is. They have built this narrative. They have lied about these people. Trump said a long time ago, he said, it's not just me they're after. I'm just in the way. They're really after all of you. And what they're doing to the January 6th people is meant not only to punish them for going to uh, Washington on January 6th, it's meant to intimidate the rest of America. It's meant to say to everyone, don't ever protest anything we ever do again, or this is what's going to happen to you. They're trying to show everybody that they're in charge and they shouldn't be challenged. And Trump has to counteract that. Yeah. All right, Nick, tell us about this book, Justify This. Well, it's, it's like I said before, Jesse, it's literally a book about my life. Oh. Um, <laughs> I know how you like that word, but it, it's really, it's not necessarily a, a political book. You know, it's, it's really a book about how, you know, a guy like me from North Carolina who didn't know any actors and, you know, came up and, and was able to make a living as an actor. And it also has chapters in there about my, uh, my professional wrestling career and my, uh, my stand-up comedy <laughs> career, a lot of things that people don't know, know about. Oh, uh, that's just the least surprising thing in the world that you were in professional wrestling. That is just... Anyway, the book is Justify This. Nick, we'll have a steak soon, my brother. All right, it's time to lighten the mood. Well, it's annoying as we go into lighten the mood. It's annoying. I find it annoying that everybody has a month or a day now. Right, it's, it's, out today. it's midget month, uh, it's green people month, it's this month, it's that month, it's left-handed people month, like anyone needs to celebrate those freaks. But today is a day. It's a day that we all should celebrate. You, me, everybody. It's National Jesse Day. Did you know that? This is a day where we celebrate people named Jesse. Did you know that Jesse means God's gift? Pretty appropriate, if you ask me. In Hebrew, it means king. Honestly, just how accurate is all this? I am not a, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a wealth of knowledge on all the Jessies out there. I mainly just focus on me. How many Jessies do you know wrote a national best-selling book called The Anti-Communist Manifesto, which can be purchased at jessikellybook.com? I believe there's only one, and I think that's me. How many Jessies do you know? have the greatest burger recipe in history. A burger recipe that is so good, I'm not making this up, it's actually in the book. Oh, I just covered that up so you couldn't read it in time. You have to buy the book to get it. My burger recipe is in the book. I'm just kidding, you can find it for free online anywhere. But this is a day that's about me. So celebrate me tonight with friends and family. I'll see you tomorrow.